Shall we start now? Yes. Okay, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Justin Dargan. I'm a research fellow at the Dubai Initiative, uh, which um, I'm certain many of you know is a joint program between uh, the Belfer Center and, um, and the Dubai School of Government uh, located in the UAE. Now, today I'm going to speak about golf gas development, and I'm really going to get into the issues of why there is an energy crisis in the Gulf now when it seems that there shouldn't be. Uh, I will look at some of the political dangers uh, that the Middle Eastern or the Gulf countries in particular are facing in terms of um, the attempted rationalization of their energy uh, policies. So I would like to spark debate. Uh, I would want, I don't want strife per se, but I want contention, healthy, healthy uh, disagreement, you know, if you don't agree with what I say, and, and I'd like this to be a learning experience. So the main discussion points I'd like to go over, I uh, go over the basics of the Gulf gas power sector, go over the reserves and the demand, and then I move on to the current energy, energy challenges that the Gulf countries are facing. Now I speak about the strategies to increase gas supplies that many of the Gulf countries are incorporating uh, now, and I will look at um, some of the proposed solutions which I think will be able to overcome uh, many, of these, um, many of these inherent problems that are in this sector. Now to give a basic overview of the Gulf gas sector, uh, we see that uh, the Arabian Gulf region is home to some of the largest natural gas reserves in the world. So it's about 23% of global total, but it has only about 8% uh, of global production. So you can see that there's um, a big disconnect between reserves and utilization, um, and that, and, here, and therein lies a problem. Uh, again, and that's the crux of why there is a um, uh, gas production problem in most of the Gulf countries uh, right now. If we look at Qatar, we can see that clearly Qatar dominates uh, the Gulf gas reserves, or actually Middle Eastern gas reserves. It has the world's third largest natural gas reserves uh, after uh, Russia and Iran, and it's the world's number one LNG exporter. It over overtook Indonesia in 2006. Now, Saudi Arabia is uh, number two uh, in the GCC, and it has uh, roughly 270 uh, trillion cubic feet of gas uh, reserves, and it's the world's fourth largest, and the UAE is the world's fifth largest, so 200, roughly 230 uh, trillion cubic feet, and Kuwait comes in around number 20 in terms of the global total reserves. Now, taking a look at natural gas demand, the natural gas demand in the Gulf is extremely robust, and it's increasing at a rate of about 6.6% uh, annually. Uh, now, the future outlook in GCC gas consumption, and I basically place these figures in oil equivalent figures, so I, basically we can get um, our minds around this concept of gas, because we tend to understand oil consumption much more easily than, uh, than gas. So in 2010, the Oil equivalent of the gas consumption is basically four, it will be four million barrels per day. Okay, now in 2015, there's a rise of about a million barrels per day to 5.1 million um, barrels per day. Then 2020, we see 6.4 million barrels per day. So there's a clear increase in natural gas consumption that's occurring every year. Now with the exception of Qatar, every GCC country is currently facing this gas shortage. And I will look into what they're attempting to do to overcome this. And we can also see the figures uh, to the right uh, that indicate the sharp increase, or the projected increase as well, in, um, in the gas demand. Now, uh, yes, please. Now, where does the U.S. fall in terms of natural gas? OK, actually, that's a very good question. Uh, the U.S. just overtook Russia in term, because of the shale gas um, find uh, recently, just overtook Russia uh, as being the world's number one gas producer. Okay, but in terms of reserves, these countries still have the dominant reserves. Now, it still remains to be seen uh, how the shale gas is going to change uh, the American reserves uh, because it's a bit unknown. And you will hear some very enthusiastic, to put, uh, you know, to use the best word, I suppose, enthusiastic um, uh, uh, opinions or um, forecasts of how much gas uh, the U.S. has. But that's not going to be settled until a few years when production actually ramps up. So it's a bit shaky right now as to how much uh, the shale gas is going to contribute to American reserves. Uh, but in terms of production, it has already uh, influenced uh, significantly U.S. production uh, so far. But the point of the matter is that uh, the figures that I showed, these are figures based on reserves, and the production does not even meet the reserves. So that's a very big issue. And outside of culture, the rest of the countries haven't um, rationalized and haven't utilized their, their gas production to match the reserves. Uh, now, there's an organic relationship between the power demand and natural gas uh, in the Middle East, or in the Gulf in particular. One of the reasons is that for most of the countries, they utilize natural gas in order to produce their power. So we can see that uh, in the GCC, in order to uh, keep up 
with the gas demand, they are going to need to add about 60 gigawatts of additional power between 2010 and 2015. Now, this represents about 80% of the current capacity, which is about 77,000 megawatts. And we can see that to the figure, uh, figure to the right. Uh, demand growth in power has been about 7.7% uh, 7 .7 annual growth uh, from about 2007 into 2015. Now, the global economic crisis has taken a chunk out of that, but it hasn't taken quite a significant chunk. And one of the reasons why is because in order to deal with um, the credit freeze and the global economic crisis, I mean, the GCC countries have developed a huge stimulus plans for infrastructure growth. So we still have projections of enormous growth in gas and power demand in the coming years. So we don't really foresee this showing. Although there was uh, a slight, um, let's say, lessening of uh, power demand we can see in about 2008 in the global economic crisis. Um, was finally, uh, the countries became cognizant of it and credit froze. And we all remember the panic days during that time period and we thought it was the end of the world, or many people did. Now, just to give an example, okay, I took uh, the UAE uh, as a result, just to show uh, how much population has been increasing. And then we can see that in accord with the population growth, there's been um, uh, power demand growth, electricity growth. So we can see here, at the figure to the right, which is the electricity uh, demand, uh, that is basically growing about 10% uh, annually okay, in the UAE. Okay, now that bears, or that's actually an extremely strong correlation, or it bears actually, there's a direct relationship with, uh, with the demographic revolution that's occurring in the Gulf. And of course, the demographic revolution, um, which is occurring uh, in particular with the UAE, that is due to the importation of foreign labor as well, so expatriates and so on. So uh, it's projected that in the Gulf, uh, the population will double from 40 million today uh, to about 80 million by 2030. Okay, so that's going to put additional strains on the ability for the countries to provide uh, power and natural gas to the populace. Now, what are the reasons behind a demand growth? Uh, well, one of the major ones is uh, the second, what I call the second oil price revolution from about 2001, 2002 into 2008. Uh, now, the second oil price revolution is um, basically with the increase in the international price of oil uh, that happened uh, around 2001, late 2001, that brought in huge inflows of foreign revenue uh, into the Gulf countries. So we see an unparalleled uh, period of uh, modernization, industrialization that occurred in these countries, and the sovereign wealth funds, for the most part, were buttressed by this period. Now, the first oil price revolution, of course, was 1973, 1974, with the oil embargo. That was when we saw a quadrupling of the international price of oil, uh, just within a period of a few weeks. Now, what that did um, is it allowed the Gulf countries to have uh, access to enormous sums of uh, foreign revenue, and at that time, many of the Gulf countries didn't have the human capital to be able to utilize this efficiently. So what they did was they either engaged in construction of uh, so-called white elephant projects or prestige projects, or what they did was they just put all the money into T-bills. And uh, they didn't really use the money for sustained domestic uh, industrialization and investment. Now, there was also a demographic explosion that I spoke about earlier. Uh, there's a major push for industrialization that occurred during this period. That's another factor behind the demand growth. There's also the petrochemical expansion uh, that has occurred in the Gulf. And the petrochemical expansion is whereby the Gulf countries no longer want to be merely primary product exporting countries. They want to produce value on their territory and export that to the West. So we start to see uh, large numbers of foreign petrochemical plants that are relocating to the Gulf to take advantage of these low uh, gas prices, below market price gas um, gas prices, and also the inexpensive uh, foreign labor, and also the not so strict environmental laws. And uh, the Gulf countries are using that as a form of technology transfer as well, and attempting to adapt their populace to the skill set transfer that's occurring at the same time. Um, there's also a large need for desalination projects, and this puts um, an enormous strain on uh, the power. Uh, uh, power uh, supply. There has been increased oil capacity expansion um, because many of the Gulf countries, their oil fields are mature, and mature oil fields mean that um, production is, uh, is not as robust as it was, so production is falling off. Uh, so what they do in order to maintain the production or increase it, they will inject natural gas into the oil field. 
and natural gas will budget production. So that's another big chunk of the natural gas demand is going for oil field uh, reinjection. Uh, and also the low administrative gas prices in the region is another uh, huge factor. Um, in the region, there's the average, the average price of natural gas for domestic sales is about $1 per MMBTU. Okay, uh, now this gas price is, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a subsidy per se, but it's, there's a huge opportunity cost that the Gulf countries are um, incurring by supplying their domestic um, constituents, I suppose, with uh, this natural gas and instead of exporting it as LNG to the international market. So for instance, in Japan, uh, many of the Gulf countries are able to get about $20 per MMBTU uh, to give an example. I mean, so you have to weigh the industrialization plans and also the energy social contract and whether they want to get increased foreign revenue. So these are factors that the Gulf countries are attempting to balance, some better than others. And this extremely low administrative gas price, and the reason why I say it's administrative is because it's set by um, fiat, I guess you can say. Uh, it, it's not set by the market. Um, so because of that, it's not subject to the pressures of, of demand as a market price would be. Now to look at the fuel mix in the Middle East uh, power generation, uh, we can see that the majority of the countries, um, Bahrain, Qatar, the UAE, Oman, Iran, and Syria, um, they use for the majority of their power generation uh, natural gas. Uh, so we can see why natural gas is so important. Some of the other countries, such as Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, and Yemen, uh, they tend to use a uh, much more fuel oil. Okay, I mean, so there are different trade-offs, whereas if you use your own oil production for power generation, which tends to be much more inefficient, and there also tends to be a uh, much greater opportunity cost, <coughs> because you're using that um, you're using that oil for domestic uh, power production and you're not selling it for $70 plus on the international market. What's the yellow? Ah. Oh, those are alternative fuel supplies. Okay, so those are, it can be anything. It can be, for instance, uh, uh, in some countries they have uh, started to use uh, certain renewable energy. I, so basically the yellow is anything but fuel oil. The fuel oil is basically, uh, you can see that by the clear blue. And then the, the dark blue one is actually, I'm sorry, no, excuse me. Uh, the light blue one is natural gas. The dark blue is actually fuel oil, okay? And then the yellow is any alternative fuel supply that they use. Uh, now, in terms of the gas crunch, uh, how it, I will go over how it impacted um, several different uh, Gulf countries. Uh, Kuwait became the first country that imported LNG, uh, which was, um, uh, quite phenomenal in terms of what it did to psychological barriers for a Gulf country to import energy. I imported LNG uh, in 2009 and uh, during the summer of 2009 because it was under extreme pressure uh, to meet its uh, domestic uh, power, uh, power demand. Uh, now to give some examples, the petroleum industries uh, company in Kuwait had to shut down Syria and ammonia plants at Shueba in May of 2009 simply because it did not have enough feedstock to meet uh, to meet the petrochemical demand. Uh, there have been annual summer brownouts. Um, I spent um, about six months in the Gulf um, from this past summer until December, so actually I saw this firsthand, whereby there were blackouts that were occurring in many of the residential areas. Uh, so it is quite surprising. Um, their further chemical, uh, petrochemical expansion is also being hampered uh, by the lack of gas supplies. And to illustrate this, uh, by 2000, in 2005, about uh, 450 million cubic feet uh, per day were going to the industrial sector, and now that's only about 370 to 380 million cubic feet per day. I mean, so we can see that there are enormous strains that are being put on the Kuwaiti uh, gas production, and Kuwait is attempting to to balance uh, the needs of its industrialization plans by the petrochemical um, faction, as well as uh, the residential faction. Uh, you know, they want they basically see, uh, let's say, access to inexpensive energy as being its birthright. I mean, so Kuwait is attempting to deal with all of that, and it's not really doing the best job that it could be at the moment, but it, it has uh, severe constraints. Now, Saudi Arabia has taken to burning large amounts of crude and fuel oil for power, and its natural gas demand is expected to double uh, from about uh, 7 billion cubic feet per day to about um, 14 uh, billion cubic feet, uh, feet per day in 2030. Now this could impact uh, Saudi Arabia's future oil exports because if it's not able to meet its gas demand, then Saudi Arabia burns fuel oil 
for its uh, domestic power generation. So as a result, uh, Saudi Arabia may not be able to keep up when the global economy returns, uh, the global economy returns to growth, may not be able to supply enough oil to meet um, the return of um, oil demand in the global economy. So that could be an issue in the next um, two to three years. Uh, there have been uh, reports of reduced propane availability as well due to the demand uh, demand stress. Uh, and Saudi Arabia has also experienced uh, major problems because most of its gas is associated gas. Now the difference between associated gas and unassociated gas is that associated gas is produ produced alongside of oil, oil production. Uh, so as a result, when you put an OPEC quota on your oil production, then by necessity, you also restrict your gas production at the same time. So many of the countries in the Gulf, they don't, they haven't explored uh, their unassociated gas fields, which are just gas fields by themselves. So as a result, when you see uh, OPEC quotas placed, it is reducing their availabil the availability of uh, natural gas. Uh, so they are attempting to balance this as well, their focus on being oil producers between the natural gas which is needed for the domestic uh, sectors. So that's another issue that I'd like uh, you to keep in mind. Now the UAE has been importing uh, about 1.8 billion cubic feet per day of natural gas from Qatar uh, through the Dauphin um, Pipeline Gas Project. Now the Dauphin Pipeline Gas Project came online in 2007 and it exports gas from Qatar's north field to the UAE and Oman. Uh, now, without Dolphin gas, uh, the UAE would have been in a very, very bad position. Uh, the majority of this gas is going to Dubai and to Abu Dhabi, and uh, that gas came just in time uh, to meet their demand because otherwise it would have been going through uh, power uh, outages such as uh, Kuwait is going through, and that would have been de extremely detrimental to uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, as you can imagine, but to save them just in time. Uh, by 2025, this gas shortage is expected uh, to triple. Now, when I was in uh, the UAE in uh, 2009, uh, during the summer, uh, there was a blackout, a sustained blackout in Sharjah uh, for several months, actually for the entire Ramadan. And uh, that was not really expressed in the international uh, news so much, but that caused uh, severe uh, uh, issues uh, domestically uh, for the UAE. Uh, leadership and um, basically people were, were, they did not understand why is it that uh, the UAE exports uh, gas but at the same time there wasn't enough gas to power uh, their uh, electricity uh, production. Um, so that's, that was a, a huge issue, it was covered in the paper every day uh, when I was there. Uh, uh, please? The UAE, they have uh, rich oil resources. Uh, they do. Why don't they use foil oil and like that kind of things yes. for oil extraction and electricity for consumer demand and that kind of things and they import natural gas? Okay, uh, well they are importing natural gas through the Dolphin Project so they are, are, are already doing that. Uh, and some of the Emirates, they are burning uh, fuel oil. Uh, they are. So it depend, uh, different Emirates have their own uh, energy um, say energy ministry or whatnot. So they, they utilize uh, different fuel mixes uh, in terms of power production. So when you look at the northern Emirates, they are utilizing uh, fuel oil uh, to, for power production. Uh, but uh, Dubai doesn't use it as much, but uh, Dubai will utilize it for peak production, or for peak demand, excuse me. So it, it just depends. But another thing as well is that uh, the Abu Dhabi, uh, for instance, it, it does not want to incur that quite significant opportunity cost of supplying this oil for domestic consumption for the, at the retail sector, okay, where there are below market prices for electricity, I mean, or two to three cents per kilowatt hour, for instance, okay, when it can sell, that ga when it can sell the oil on the interna international market uh, for about 70 plus dollars. I mean, so you can imagine, I mean, the, this discrepancy. And uh, not only is the electricity price extremely low, uh, most individuals don't even pay their electricity bills. I mean, it's actually uh, unheard of, uh, really, for nationals to pay electricity bills. So, I mean, that's that's another dynamic. One more question. Yes. Uh, UAE, do they import natural gas from the price that Japanese? No, uh, Japan not at all. Okay. Not twenty dollars. No, 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 no. Actually, that price was uh, what you could call a political price. When they negotiated with uh, Qatar, uh, they were able to secure a price of about one dollar and twenty cents to one dollar and thirty cents per MBTO. Okay, but uh, I will get into that later because that is. Uh, influencing Qatar not to increase the gas exports to the UAE because uh, of the price they can get on the international market. So as a result, there are not 
no one is projecting additional supplies to be exported from Qatar because uh, the countries are not accepting the slow price for a second phase of uh, dolphin shipments to the UAE. So that was a very sweet deal, and we're not going to see that again, fundamentally. Uh, now, in 2008, uh, the UAE government um, developed the white paper. Now, this official white paper uh, stated that uh, the UAE power demand will rise from about 15,000 megawatts in 2008 to about 40,000 in, in, in 2020. And the UAE feels that uh, there will not be enough natural gas to meet this demand increase. But I, I beg to differ. There is enough natural gas to meet it, but there's not enough production uh, to meet it. Now, this served as a rationale for the nuclear program. Uh, so that's one of the primary reasons why the UAE is attempting or is going to develop um, the nuclear plants that should come online uh, within the next several years, I believe 2016, if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, Oman is uh, importing as well 200 million cubic <coughs> feet from the Dolphin Project. So altogether, Qatar is exporting about 2 billion cubic feet of uh, gas per day to the UAE and Oman. And Oman, uh, its allocation is 200. Uh, 200 million cubic feet. Uh, now, in 2010, uh, the gas demand in Oman is expected to reach about uh, 3.8 billion cubic feet per day. Now, this is versus a domestic production rate of 2.6 billion cubic feet per day. So, uh, the Sultanate has uh, several uh, LNG trains, and these account for uh, an enormous uh, share of its um, gas consumption, more than half. And this uses about 1.3, uh, 1.34 billion cubic feet uh, per day of gas. Uh, and electricity demand is increasing by about 15% annually, and water desalination by about 10% annually. Now, uh, yes? I want to, this is a, probably a very naive question. I hope yes. I'm not the only one in here. Why are they exporting? No, no, no. Okay. An LNG train is actually a train? Or oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have explained that. No, 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 no. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, an LNG train is actually, uh, that, that's that's the lingo, I guess. You, that's the jargon. It's, it's, it's when you take, when you produce natural gas from the gas field, okay, and then what the, the processing of that natural gas into LNG. So that entire production facility until you export it would be called the LNG train. So from production to processing and to the point of export. Okay, so then you have to chill the gas and process it, remove the impurities. So that, that's called an LNG train in the, in the energy uh, sector uh, jargon. Um, okay, oh, uh, there's one thing I'd like to point out though. Now, LNG is for export, of course, okay, because you export natural gas on a ship, okay, because uh, natural gas has one, uh, one of the odd things about natural gas, obviously, is that it's extremely difficult to, to, uh, to export because either you build a pipeline or you have to ship by LNG. Now, Oman is importing gas, and its gas demand is increasing at an extremely robust rate, but at the same time, it has to export gas, and it can't save that gas for domestic uh, demand. Uh, one of the reasons is it's locked in extremely long-term contracts with uh, several nations. Uh, Asia, for instance, uh, so it can't break those contracts without um, incurring um, substantial displeasure um, by the international market. So it, it's really in quite um, uh, a delicate situation right now uh, for the leadership because additional gas is not coming from Qatar, and uh, they're attempting to deal with the Iranians, but that is an entirely different issue, which which I get into. Now, what are the ramifications of of this? Um, of the gas crisis in the Gulf. Well, it's that uh, the price paid for the natural gas domestically in, in all the Gulf countries, except for Qatar, is extremely uh, low. Uh, it's about uh, minus $1.50 per MMBTU uh, as the average. Now, this is, now you should compare this to the production international prices or the production cost. So, international prices, at the high end of the spectrum, you have sales to Japan, which are about, uh, you can get about $20 per MMBTU, uh, you can get uh, European, uh, let's say, purchases for about um, $13 per MMBTU, for instance, 10 to $13, uh, but uh, the domestic price is minus $1.50. Uh, so this is causing uh, a bit of distortion uh, in the domestic market when you look at investment decisions. And the production cost of the domestic gas as well is increasing uh, because the additional gas fines um, in the Gulf tend to be uh, riddled with uh, impurities such as uh, sulfur and so on. So the processing cost is increasing as well. So you're finding that in many of these countries, what used to be uh, a wellhead price, okay, wellhead price means that you basically um, 
supply that gas to the domestic market for what it costs to take it out of the ground. So you're not subsidizing the gas. But because the production cost is increasing, but at the same time, uh, the pricing framework is not keeping up with that. It's actually turning into a subsidy. Okay. Uh, now the price of electricity is much too low as well, and as I indicated earlier, that has an organic connection with uh, natural gas uh, production. Uh, and this is uh, impacting electricity generation, and now it tends to be a dual subsidy. Natural gas uh, feedstock domestically is supplied at a below market rate uh, price, which is turned into a subsidy as I indicated. And then the electricity tariff as well is extremely low, and for uh, nationals it tends to be non-existent. So we see two s subsidies more or less that are operating. So it, it's increasing the strain on power and natural gas production. Uh, now the main obstacle uh, between the two regional suppliers, uh, notably Iran and Qatar, number two and three respectively in terms of natural gas um, reserves uh, in the world, and the regional consumers, Kuwait, the UAE, and Bahrain, have all been pricing issues. So basically, uh, the consuming countries refuse to pay more for natural gas than what they have received before and what they supply their domestic market, uh, the price that they supply their domestic market. So. Uh, the exporting countries, uh, or the potential exporting countries such as Iran and Qatar, refuse to sell at that price. So the issues that we're seeing between these two blocks is that one will only sell at a specified price, which will be about uh, Qatar, notably, for about four or five dollars per MBTU and higher, and others, consuming countries, will not pay more than let's say two dollars per MBTU for gas import. So that's one of the main issues. And we can see this exemplified with um, Iranian, potential Iranian gas production and export from the Salmon Field. Uh, the Salmon Field is, um, is a gas field uh, in the Iranian territory. Now the National Iranian Gas Exporting Company uh, and Crescent Petroleum, which is a charger-based company, had actually signed a contract to, uh, to produce and to supply gas from this Iranian gas field to the UAE. Uh, the shipment was actually supposed to start um, I believe about a year or two ago, actually, no, no, actually it had been 2005. No, it, it was 2005. And uh, what happened was that uh, Iran basically indicated that the price that it, it had agreed at that time when the contract was signed, about 2000 or 2001, um, that was no longer uh, justifiable given the current market conditions. And the price was linked to the price of oil, which at that time was um, extremely low. So. The gas price uh, that they agreed upon was about 50 cents per MMBTU, and Iran says that is no longer uh, acceptable. Uh, so as a result, uh, Iran is hedging. Now this is currently in international arbitration, so we'll see how that uh, turns out. Now, uh, please. Justin, can yes. you give me a sense of uh, what these prices <coughs> are relative to oil? Okay. Uh, like it's a BTUs to oil barrel equivalent, something like that. Okay, what you mean in terms of energy utilization or just in terms of prices? Because there yeah, is... You know, if you buy oil, say, at $70 per barrel, yes, what yes. would be the equivalent if you bought gas? Okay, okay, well, okay, I, I can tell you like this, in terms of pricing, okay, uh, different countries employ different pricing framework in terms of oil. So, uh, but generally the pricing tends to be, uh, or the linkage tends to be much more organic when you look at the Gulf and things are much closer. So some of them will wait, uh, let's say the price, international price of oil much higher than mm -hmm. other countries. So in Iran, there tends to be um, nearly, nearly equivalent linkage between the price of oil that it can sell in the international market and the price of natural gas. But the thing is, when you look at, there is no such thing right now as the international price of gas. There, there is no such thing. I, because uh, gas contracts for a long time have been negotiated, so the price was a contracted for price. Um, so as a result, there was this, this framework that you could use, which was in the stratosphere, for instance, I mean, it was an abstract framework, and then you basically use that to, to develop the, price, the pricing matrix in negotiations with the consuming country, for instance. So uh, one of the issues is that uh, when you look at the pricing between natural gas and oil, uh, it did make sense for a long time. Uh, because as I told, or as I as I explained earlier, is that uh, with associated gas per, with associated gas production coming from oil fields, it made sense to link uh, the price of gas with the price of oil because the two were connected. The production rates were nearly 
uh, the same. Uh, but now there are many more unassociated gas fields that are coming online. Uh, there tends to be this uh, bifurcation or divergence between oil production and natural gas production. So uh, I think that this this linkage between oil, uh, the price, you know, the, the price linkage between oil and natural gas is going to start to break apart, and there and natural gas will start to have its own internal logic. Um, but basically, the countries are looking at what it could get for LNG exports. Okay, so most of the countries are looking at the golden deal of Japan, for instance, where it could get about $20 per human BTU, or China, or so on. And they're holding out because they don't want to sell this gas domestically, even though it makes much more sense to build pipelines regionally, export the gas to your neighbors, have a fair price than it does to build LNG trains and ship it all the way to, to Britain, for instance, or North America, or all with shale gas that's no longer necessary, or to Japan. So. I hope I your pipelines question. have hostage problems, right? The buyer can always, uh, you know, after the other guy has invested well, in yes, so yes. energy, isn't, isn't it more prefer isn't that preferable? Well, well with right? the Gulf countries, uh, outside of Iran, you really wouldn't have this issue. Uh, in terms of Qatar, uh, most of the countries, they get along quite well. I mean, there was a problem with Saudi, a political issue with Saudi Arabia, but it doesn't look likely that uh, the Gulf countries are going to hold each other hostage over natural gas sales. That tends to be over pipeline sales. That tends to be much more with uh, countries that might have economic and political differences, such as the Ukraine and Russia. But these countries are extremely similar, and they are integrating quite rapidly in the GCC as a bloc. Um, Except with, for Iran, then the, except for there's Iran. no problem. There, there could be, well, there could be hostage issues with Iran, but these countries are in such need of natural gas that they're willing to overlook that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we see that Qatar is building its LNG capacity, and sometimes it's shipping, or it was negotiating to ship the LNG to its neighbors. So it basically, uh, basically, uh, Qatar had, um, had uh, its number six LNG train was supposed to come online, and it was negotiating with Kuwait Okay, to sell that gas to, to sell that LNG to Kuwait, which, which fundamentally makes no sense because it would be better for it to just build a pipeline to Kuwait, and that'd be much more that'd be economically feasible rather than shipping it through LNG. Um, when you deal with Iran, Iran doesn't have the LNG infrastructure uh, because the LNG infrastructure is um, quite advanced. It requires um, a state of technical knowledge that Iran does not have, and it hasn't been able to master this technology at the moment. Uh, so as a result, it needs international investment from the international oil companies uh, to produce this this, um, this technology. But as we know, international oil companies are not rushing into Iran at the moment. So Iran is, is uh, focusing on its southern export strategy, building uh, pipelines with its neighbors and exporting gas to its pipelines because there are problems with selling to Europe and selling to, selling to natural gas to Europe and other countries. Um, but there is this contention, though, this conundrum, because the regional buyers don't want to, um, they simply don't want to pay the price which is, Iran is demanding. And Iran wants to introduce European prices into the region. And what it calls European prices are basically about 10 to $13 per MMBTU. BTU. Uh, that's what the Europeans pay for natural gas um, on, the, on the average. And so these countries understandably don't want to, um, don't want to deal with that. Um, we can also see that, um, Oh, there was a pricing, also there was a pricing problem with uh, Kuwait LNG import uh, from Qatar. So uh, Kuwait did not want to pay more than a few dollars per MBTU, and Qatar demanded um, a much higher price, around six dollars or even higher per MBTU. So negotiations broke down, so Kuwait um, inked a deal with uh, Shell, and is importing LNG from, uh, from Shell, Shell's international portfolio. So here we have Kuwait is importing gas from Sakhalin, for instance, off of in Russia's uh, Far East. I mean, so it, it makes no sense. We can see that the natural gas rationalization uh, in the Gulf is, is uh, a bit distorted in terms of utilization. Now, some of the strategies that the countries have incorporated to attempt to overcome this, this, uh, this, this, this conundrum is, um, is related below. Uh, Dauphin in, there's been um, Dauphin interruptible supply. Now, uh, I, I stated earlier that Qatar uh, was not going to increase its contracted for gas sales or export to the Gulf countries, to the consuming countries. But what it did agree to in the summer of 2009 is that, uh, that it would uh, export an interruptible supply through the Dolphin pipeline. Now basically interruptible supply means that there is no firm commitment to supply this. So anytime gas is needed elsewhere, 
that Hunter would just be able to ship the gas without incurring any type of um, uh, issue or any type of contractual uh, problem from uh, the countries involved. So the, the Oman and the UAE, they recognize this and they have accepted it simply because their natural gas demand is uh, too great. Um, there has been regional LNG import, as I stated earlier, Shell is exporting to Kuwait, and um, there have been uh, talks of country LNG exports to Dubai. Uh, many of the countries are uh, looking to stimulate their domestic uh, gas production. Uh, the UAE is, uh, wants to develop its $10 billion uh, Shah uh, sour gas field. Uh, sour gas is basically impure gas, uh, polluted gas that has sulfur in it, so the processing costs uh, tend to be uh, quite high. Saudi Arabia uh, wants, to, uh, uh, wants to start production from the Karen field in Kuwait uh, from two main fields, the Sabri and Um Nepal uh, fields. Uh, now the pipeline import is also in our strategy that I spoke about earlier. Uh, some of the countries want, have opened up negotiations with Iran uh, because of this Iran southern export strategy, uh, but the primary problem is not the nuclear issue or the political in, politically induced sanctions. It, it tends to be uh, Iran's, uh, let's say, desire to introduce European prices into the region, so the countries are balking at that. Uh, many of the countries have focused on development of renewable and alternative energy, so this is the crux of the GCC nuclear plan. Uh, because of the inability to produce or supply natural gas uh, to keep up with its natural gas uh, demand. Uh, so that's, that's the basic issue of it. It really does not have much to do, in my view, with uh, Iran developing nuclear energy as a hedge to weaponize in the future. Uh, it has to do with the fact that these countries are going through extreme contradictions in their energy sectors. Uh, there have been various solar and wind initiatives, um, and of course we all know the Mustar uh, initiative uh, in Abu Dhabi, uh, to the $20 billion initiative to make a zero carbon uh, city. Uh, and there have also been coal-fired plants uh, that have, um, some are being built, um, and some are just on the planning table right now. Um, in the planning stages, uh, Oman is thinking about building coal-fired plants, and in the northern Emirates, they're, they, they're thinking about building that as well. Uh, and then, where did they get the coal? Uh, from South Africa. <laughs> so you're right. You're pretty easy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. right. So, so, so you, you can imagine logistically what they have to deal with the supply chain. I mean, so it, it's quite, quite an issue. Um, Reinjection alternatives. They've also been focusing on uh, research to use nitrogen and carbon for enhanced oil recovery, EOR. Um, generally, uh, in order to buttress production, they use natural gas, and that takes uh, a lion's share uh, of, um, of natural gas production. So there's research on utilizing either nitrogen or carbon in order to keep up these <coughs> oil or production rates. What is the, the, how does the cost for nuclear energy work? Okay. with gas, investment in gas production? Well, actually, investment in gas production, I would say, is much more economical. With nuclear energy, you have enormous upfront capital costs. Okay, but once you get those capital costs out of the way, uh, then basically your uh, marginal cost is extremely low, okay, in terms of production from uh, nuclear plants. Uh, now, natural gas, uh, most of the natural gas fields, the unassociated natural gas fields that are coming online now, are a bit uh, impure, so they either have sulfur. Uh, it's what's it's what's known as complex gas, so it's not easy gas. It either has sulfur, which means it's sour, or it's tight gas, which means that it's stuck in crevices. Okay, and that takes a lot of technology to be able to get out, and uh, or it might be ultra deep, so about sixteen thousand feet plus deep beneath the ground. So all of these are challenges, and it increases the production cost exponentially. So if you compare that with the price or the cost of producing gas from associated gas fields, where once you have the capital infrastructure in place to produce the oil, then the gas just comes up. I mean, so that's one of the reasons why for many years they were just flaring the gas. And even today, they're, they're still flaring the gas, even though it has, um, they're in need of the gas and it has uh, economical uses, uh, uh, utilization for them. Um, so those are the main issues. Nuclear power for them is, I, I would say it's not necessarily the best option, uh, but it's, they're basically trying to do anything they can to get out of this, out of this, um, this, this energy crisis. Um, one benefit that nuclear energy does have is that uh, it allows the countries to produce from either uranium or plutonium their power and then for the retail sector, which tends not to be as productive for industrialization, and it will save the oil 
and save the natural gas either for natural gas for petrochemical production or oil for export. So that's basically what they're looking for because uh, for the petrochemical production you need natural gas feedstock and that is a, a very, that's an essential part of their industrialization plans uh, in order to create um, an advanced country that uh, has a manufacture, manufacturing sector. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why nuclear energy could actually be uh, a good bet for them. But otherwise, I mean, they have enormous natural gas uh, reserves, so it does make sense for them to produce from that. But they're looking at the retail sector as being inherently unproductive for industrialization, modernization of the country. So they want to use nuclear energy for that, that power production. But, but even though, even so, nuclear would, would only satisfy a portion of the electricity demand, yes. 25%? Yes, yes it would, but as you know in the UAE the, the announcement was for four nuclear plants to come yeah. online, okay, and uh, basically they said that they will build as many as necessary in order to meet domestic demand, so they, they, they have said that the four nuclear plants are not going to be, um, are, are not the only options on the table. If need be, if demand increases more than they expected, then there will be a second slate of uh, nuclear plants that would be built. So they would basically cover uh, the UAE nuclear plants if possible uh, in order to meet this uh, domestic power uh, demand for the retail sector at least. Uh, there have also been uh, gas cities. Now gas cities is a novel concept. It was developed by Donna Gas, and uh, the idea behind this is that there is a core industrial complex, okay, and uh, it is it will house uh, these energy intensive industries, so you look at steel, cement, petrochemicals, all in one site. And uh, there would be economies of scale uh, that would be utilized there as well as gas supply guarantees from the government. So uh, the Gulf countries, they had to develop this because their natural or their power demand shortage or their power, uh, their power uh, supply shortages have, have actually uh, caused quite a bit of um, uh, fear and trepidation amongst uh, international uh, companies that are seeking to site their uh, facilities there because they feel that there might not be enough gas or electricity available. Uh, so uh, the development of this particular plan, basically the governments are saying that, in particular the UAE, is that we will supply, give a sovereign guarantee that power will be available uh, for any company who wants to place uh, their plants in our, on our territory. Now there's also another concept which is a bit linked to that but also a bit different. It's um, on-site power production. Uh, so Gasco and the Emirates Aluminum uh, Company, uh, they have opened up the largest, uh, or actually Emirates Aluminum has, has actually constructed the largest aluminum uh, uh, production facility uh, in the world. And uh, what Gasco did, which is an Emirati uh, gas company, uh, they have opened up a natural gas pipeline directly from uh, the gas field to uh, to the aluminum plant, so there will be on-site power production, and that's one of the ways that uh, they're attempting to mitigate this um, the power shortages uh, in the region, electricity outages, and so on. So this will be a guaranteed, dedicated uh, natural gas um, exporter supply from the gas field directly to the to the aluminum plant. And there have also been energy conservation campaigns uh, in the UAE. They recently started the Heroes of the UAE campaign to attempt to encourage people uh, to save uh, electricity, to conserve electricity. Uh, although one of the problems in the UAE is that uh, electricity basically has no price, so the consumer does not feel any pain uh, if the individual just leaves uh, the TVs and air conditioning on and, and leaves the home. There is no financial uh, uh, burden. And another thing is that there's a high turnover uh, in the UAE due to the expatriate labor force. So you're always having new people coming, new people leaving. So as a result, it takes time to educate them. There's been the Tarshid campaign, which is nearly the equivalent uh, in Kuwait as well. Some of the proposed solutions uh, that, I, that I suggest is that uh, the strategies that I told you previously are merely cosmetic. Okay, they don't go to the underlying issues. Okay, uh, unless the, unless the GCC countries uh, deal with the underlying structural issues of why they have these gas, uh, why they're having the gas crisis and the power, uh, power crisis, uh, these solutions will merely just cover over what will continue to occur in the future. Uh, pricing reformation is what is essential uh, in order to move this um, extremely, in order to mitigate this extremely high uh, power power demand. Because uh, if they don't reform the pricing structure, then what 
that is going to do. It's going to distort the investment decisions of the Gulf countries and also it will encourage this uh, false demand. And what I call false demand is when the consumer does not pay for uh, the power or electricity, uh, then the consumer is more, much more apt to use it in a wasteful way. Uh, the new sources of, of unassociated gas as well are becoming much more expensive to, are much more expensive to produce, um, in many cases uh, over five dollars per MMBTU. So without a comprehensive price review, uh, the regional suppliers such as Qatar and Iran are now going to sell and uh, it will also be much more difficult to obtain uh, the international oil company uh, investment uh, into gas production um, because gas is a bit difficult for many of the Middle Eastern countries to produce on their own. So that's why you see a lot of JVs uh, with uh, international oil companies, uh, because uh, many countries simply don't have the expertise uh, currently to produce a gas by themselves. So by necessity, they need to enter into partnerships with international oil companies. Um, I propose the development of a rational domestic gas price that's one. Uh, most of the GCC countries have enough gas to supply the domestic demand. Uh, but they will have to transition into more unassociated uh, gas. And as I stated earlier, there tends to be um, production issues uh, related with that because the gas either tends to be uh, polluted or, or deep underneath the ground. Uh, now, this cost of unassociated gas production uh, is rapidly increasing, and at a minimum, the cost of this production is between 4 to $5 per MMBTU. When you, now, you should contrast that with the domestic price of gas, which is about uh, below $1.50 per MMBTU. Uh, so there must be a comprehensive review of the domestic gas prices as well as electricity tariffs, which are about two to five cents on average uh, per kilowatt hour uh, in the Gulf. So demand is extremely inflated, and this low retail market price incre uh, encourages overconsumption. Uh, I think that there should be a dual pricing system uh, because for me, the country's industrialization is um, the priority. Uh, they want to modernize uh, their countries. Uh, so I think that the industrial sector should be granted an at-cost uh, price. So the cost of production, whether that production is from associated fields or unassociated fields. And I think that uh, the retail sector should be gradually brought to cost plus, cost plus framework. Because the retail sector, sim frankly put, does not really uh, contribute that much to the industrialization of the country. And I really think that now the countries need to engage in a rationalization of their, um, of their gas production and power production as well. Please. Is there a problem with exporting uh, subsidized uh, products of petrochemicals? There is. Uh, uh, is Saudi Arabia part of WTO? It is, yes. Is there any objection to it subsidizing its petrochemicals or are people happy for them to uh, oh. enjoy the pollution. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, actually, that's a very good. That's a very good point. Uh, now, there are several issues that are embedded in that. Um, I'll just go over the most uh, topical. Uh, one, uh, it's subsidized, yes, but uh, basically, the Gulf countries argue that because they weren't discriminating against other sectors, that it wasn't. It was not necessarily a subsidy per se. Okay, so that was one argument. So, because they're giving this natural gas. Okay, at below market rates to all comers. So if you're a foreign uh, petrochemical company, then you can take advantage of this extremely low price. Uh, or if you're another type of uh, corporation, you can take advantage. If you're a domestic corporation, you can as well. So because it was given to all, uh, they argued that it wasn't necessary an illegal subsidy under the WTO rules. Two, they argued that uh, it was actually not a subsidy because they were not selling it at below the cost of production, okay, which is what a true subsidy is, as, as defined. Uh, they argue that simply below the market price, the international price of gas. So they say, or they argue that they are supplying their domestic market at the cost of production. Okay, and that it's basically a competitive advantage. Uh, that, that, that goes all right with WTO? Well, not quite, because uh, with each ascension of energy producing nations, uh, the WTO plus requirements have actually become greater, okay, and the de demands have become uh, 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 much um, more focused on how the energy sector is organized. Uh, so with Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia actually engaged in negotiations with the WTO and it promised or pledged to uh, break away from this pricing framework, this below market price after a period of several years. So there has been um, movement away from these prices and uh, within several years Saudi Arabia has pledged to the WTO that it will remove uh, these uh, preferential uh, pricing schemes domestically.
So how that is going to be constructed it remains to be seen. Uh, but uh, I think really, if you want to look at it, look at the Russian ascension okay, uh, to the WTO. Now that natural gas is actually going to be one of the most significant issues with Russian ascension to the WTO, even much more so than uh, Saudi Arabia. So if you really want to see how natural gas pricing or dual pricing, the pricing for export and the pricing for the domestic sector is going to take center stage, uh, look at the Russian negotiations with the WTO. Um, now, the rest of the Gulf nations are basically continuing with business as usual. Um, the Western companies, uh, petrochemical companies, have not uh, pushed their governments to bring suit uh, in the WTO against the Gulf countries as of yet, uh, simply because they're relocating many of their facilities to the Gulf to take advantage of many of these uh, inexpensive, to take advantage of the inexpensive feedstock, the low cost of foreign labor, and also the, the lax environmental uh, regulations. Uh, so they're actually citing their facilities there. So that is a big reason why we don't see as many, um, we don't see as much pressure on the Gulf countries as could be. And another issue, which the, the situation is still a bit fluid, is that the shale gas revolution in the U.S. I mean, so that's brought uh, natural gas prices in the U.S. to below $4. So whereas in the Gulf, it, it might have been a competitive advantage uh, to, let's say, supply natural gas to the domestic uh, sector at about $2, uh, $1.50, $2 per MBTU. Uh, now with uh, shale gas in the U.S., that's actually becoming uh, not so, so much of an issue. Um, the, competi the competitive advantage is not going to be as great in the years coming. Uh, there should also be, in tandem with the development of uh, of a domestic, a rational domestic gas price, there should be a regional GCC gas price. And as of yet, there's not a, re a regional price. It's based on negotiations between the, um, the, the buyer and the seller, the importer, the exporter. So I think that there should be a basic price which is uh, developed and agreed upon by all stakeholders. And the prices, the current prices uh, for gas imports have been has shown a tendency to stabilize uh, for regional contracts in a range of about four to five dollars per MBTU. So we start to see a movement to this four to five dollars per MBTU uh, level. So I think that if the countries can agree on this basic price, make some concessions, then there won't really be a problem with Qatar uh, exporting additional gas supplies to the rest of the to its neighbors. Um, and I also think that on the demand side, the Gulf countries should address the critical energy peak usage. Uh, periods. Uh, so there should be, um, for instance, uh, smart grid technology, uh, increased electricity tariff, especially during the peak periods. Abu Dhabi has already started to do that. Uh, there should be incorporation of district cooling. Uh, are all of you familiar with district cooling? Okay, district cooling is basically uh, a way to uh, rationalize, uh, let's say, cooling uh, in a particular uh, in a particular facility. Okay, so let's say if you have a large hotel or if you have a neighborhood where there are a lot of uh, buildings that are grouped together, uh, instead of using or funneling power to produce electricity to go to this area for uh, air conditioning, what they do is they merely put water in pipes in order to induce cooling in, in this particular uh, facility or, or, or business area or whatnot. Uh, so that has actually been shown to uh, save uh, by certain studies, about 388 billion cubic feet per year. Uh, now, this would be only if half of the GCC's air conditioning needs are met through this. So, the reason why the GCC has blackouts, uh, particularly during the summer, is due to air conditioning. That is the number one um, uh, factor uh, for its extremely large uh, power demand from the retail sector is air conditioning, particularly during the summer. Uh, air conditioning is on 24 hours a day. Uh, particularly so the, the ski area, right? I'm sorry? Particularly air conditioning a ski area, indoor ski Oh, area. yeah, the indoor ski area. Yeah, I, yeah I, we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, that's another issue. Um, so to sum up, uh, the new pricing reality uh, has arrived for the Gulf, whether uh, the countries um, realize it or not. Um, they will realize it soon uh, because the regional suppliers are not going to sell less for uh, than $5 per MBTU. Uh, the domestic cost of production is uh, between 4 to $5 per MBTU. And the fuel oil uh, that is being used to meet this repressed demand, which is basically the peak demand uh, cycles, um, it has a cost of about twelve dollars uh, per, or twelve to thirteen dollars per MMBTU, and this is based on on a price of about uh, seventy-three dollars uh, per barrel. Uh, so what I mean by that is that this fuel oil that is being used to meet the peak demand, uh, 
uh, peak demand uh, power generation in Nagal, they're already paying a price through utilizing this gas in terms of the opportunity cost. So it makes sense for them to simply either buy gas from a regional supplier at a price of about $5 per MV2, or at least produce it themselves, and then sell that gas at a higher price domestically to the, um, uh, to the, power, uh, to the power utilities. And to give an example, uh, in 2006, for instance, the net back value of Kuwaiti gas was about $6.15. So that means the price of the, the cost of, to actually produce and deliver the gas uh, to uh, the residential communities and to the power sector to produce and to, uh, to, um, to supply the gas to the power sectors is about $5.82. Uh, cents and so the prices are several dollars uh, below that for uh, domestically so uh, we can see that uh, in Kuwait there are, are budgetary problems uh, now the choice for the countries is uh, in the short to midterm is either between using the high price fuel oil to meet the retail demand or purchasing the higher price gas from the regional suppliers where they can produce a uh, complex gas from domestic sources so if the retail gas and the power prices are still kept below the production costs then the government will incur substantial financial loss because <coughs> thereby it will thereby turn into a subsidy and it will, will no longer be just below market pricing um, uh, supply. Uh, and in most cases, I think that the golf consumer, and I think most of you will agree with me, uh, can afford the increase in the electricity prices. I mean, even if they increase electricity prices to uh, recoup their the production costs, it will still be much less than it is in the U.S. and most uh, Western countries. I mean, and I think most nationals in the Gulf will be able to afford that, that electricity increase. Uh, so even when we take the production costs and it's incorporated into the retail electricity price, and these will still be some of the lowest uh, electricity prices in the world. And they will no longer have to deal with blackouts. And thank you very much, and I open up the floor for any questions you have. I'm certain someone must disagree with, with some things I said. <laughs> So I'm sitting behind you, oh, yes. so I'm going to move forward a bit. Um, four to five dollars sounds very uh, sensible from a, an equilibrium standpoint. Yes. Um, it, it's comparable to what you would get if you were to look at LNG net banks um, in a six dollar world yes. in, the, in the US, which is close to what most people are, are talking about after the, the, the shell gas. Um, I'm just struggling to see the catalyst for getting there, Okay. both from the, the, the buyer's perspective the seller's perspective, that the, uh, the seller's main be the Qataris, and yes. the Iranians yes. talk and talk and talk, but they're yes. actually doing it. Um, with the Qatari moratorium, with the issues they've had with energy facilities, are they really ready to sign up for a long-term price locked in at $45? Uh, and are the buyers ready to say, okay, we need to reprice our energy locally? Right. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, as of yet, uh, Pato is not really ready to lock itself into these long-term LNG contracts. Uh, basically, Pato is looking for the arbitrage, the development of the arbitrage uh, market. So basically, when there's a price differential between two different markets, and the countries want to be able to supply that market, and if the price is uh, increase in another market, then be able to reallocate the gas to another market in order to secure a higher price. So that's what the countries are really looking for, and they're not that interested uh, to uh, pursue long-term contracts anymore. Like you, Dolphin to Right, right. Uh, but in terms on the, uh, of the buyer's perspective, uh, the buyers are going to have to do that, uh, simply because uh, if you look at even the nuclear plants in the UAE, which has been the first Gulf country to, um, to even start construction of nuclear plants, that won't even come online until 2016-2017. So in the interim, okay, you have this, I mean, they're, they're, they're going to have uh, blackouts, blackouts um, basically that will occur during the summer every year, and that has impacted uh, their industrialization plans and has scared off a lot of uh, firms that, had, that have uh, wanted to site their facilities there, for instance, and that's a big component of their industrializations to encourage FDI. So there's basically nothing that they can do. Uh, the Kuwaitis in 2009, the summer of 2009, uh, they agreed with uh, Shell uh, basically to import LNG uh, coming from as far afield as Sakhalin uh, for about uh, basically about five five to six dollars. It might make sense in to meet peak demand, it might make sense yes. to pay ten dollars as opposed to having the base load supply coming from the Qataris at five dollars all year. Uh, yes, but also uh, 
a large chunk of that uh, gas uh, consumption, uh, particularly in Kuwait, is coming from the petrochemical uh, sector. I mean, so it's not all of it. Makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, but not all of it will be going directly towards the um, uh, retail sector. Okay. I mean, what they want to do is the LNG might be going to the retail sector to meet the peak demand. Okay, of the power production, uh, and then. That. And then they will thereby save their natural gas for the petrochemical sector, basically their own domestic production. I mean, but as I as I mentioned earlier, I mean, I mean, it, it's a bit discombobulated. I mean, it, it's not it's not a rational system the way that it currently is constructed in the Gulf. Uh, and I think that if they get away from these below market pricing frameworks, and they will be able to stimulate investment uh, in these extremely large um, uh, natural gas fields. Um, but there is another aspect to that. The, the countries may be willing to accept a lower price because it's no longer a buyer's market uh, in, uh, in the LNG. Uh, one of the reasons is the shale production has come online in the U.S. Uh, the countries uh, with uh, you mean it is buyer's market. It it's no is. I'm market. sorry. I'm yeah. no longer a seller's market. Yeah. Pardon me. Yeah. And uh, the countries have wanted to supply up to a quarter of the U.S. market with its LNG, yeah. but uh, the U.S. is basically saying no. It's no longer needed because of the domestic. Uh, domestic uh, supply that's coming online. So the Europeans don't want it because of the economic <coughs> crisis. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, the countries are going to have to accept a much lower price than they were willing to accept uh, several years ago uh, before the economic crisis uh, hit. So I think that now is a perfect moment for the buyers and the sellers, or the seller until they on get a few things figured out, come together and develop a price which is mutually beneficial for both parties. But on, on the buying side, I think you need to have the buyer come forward and say, we're willing to pay $5. Yes. Who's most desperate? Who's most likely to, to, uh, to make that move? Well, Kuwait. Kuwait. Kuwait is the most desperate because Kuwait simply does not have as, as, um, as uh, deep and significant natural gas reserves as the other countries. So it, it's actually number 20 uh, in terms of the global reserves. Uh, Kuwait has uh, actually one of the most uh, irrational uh, uh, gas uh, rationalization plans uh, that, uh, that I've seen in the Gulf. I mean, so uh, the Kuwaitis, it was quite a psychological barrier that they overcame in order to even go to Shell, negotiate with Shell uh, to uh, buy LNG. Right? So that was a psychological barrier. I mean, I think the Saudis are actually uh, a bit more extreme, and it would take severe uh, uh, shortages for them to seek uh, gas import. But for a Gulf country, in particular an oil export country, to seek to import uh, energy, uh, that was basically, that would be unheard of. Uh, say 10 years ago, for instance. So I mean, I think that once they overcame the psychological barrier, I think that the rest will start to fall in line. And otherwise, uh, the countries, uh, the various countries' industrialization plans are going to be hampered. Uh, if they don't get natural gas, and if they don't agree to pay a price which the, buy, which the sellers are going to accept, uh, they are going to have uh, severe financial uh, constraints. Uh, it will limit their ability to attract FDI. And their industrialization plans will not, uh, will not be met. Final question for me: yes. the, the demand projection you had early on, uh, showing regional gas demand going from 15 BCF per day to 50 uh, BCF per day, give or take. Which was early on. Uh, one more. Right there. One, one more. Right, right there. there. Yes. That that's presumably based on a, a dollar to dollar fifty or two dollar per BTU. Correct. Not, not a four five. Dollar. Correct. 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 I mean, these are just forecasts. I mean, I mean, the global economic crisis is still impact. It, the situation is still a bit uh, fluid. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the UAE in its white paper, uh, the UAE uh, basically stated that its forecast of, uh, electricity <coughs> demand in 2020 would be 40,000 megawatts. So because of the economic crisis, the, they've actually revised that figure uh, to about 33,000 megawatts, which they feel would be necessary. I mean, so we, I mean, I see basically uh, a type of equilibrium happening <coughs> In about uh, 2011, where the demand would not necessarily outpace the available supply for many of the countries, but then once the global economy picks back up, and once the relative economies pick back up as well, uh, and then the, the liquidity frees up a bit, then we're going to start to see these extremely large demands are being placed on uh, the natural gas uh, production. I wonder if you can comment on uh, a re recent report. I read that Iran was finalizing an agreement with Pakistan to build a pipeline and then possibly go to yeah, yeah, India. Yeah. What um, do you think of those things? I, I think the Iranians like to tease people. I, I don't know why they 
why. I mean, they're in negotiations with everyone. Actually, <laughs> Iranians are known. I mean, are known to talk a very good game uh, with pipelines and LNG sales and so on. But they have not uh, delivered the goods, as they say. I mean, so I mean, they they can talk to Pakistan. They're talking to Oman. They're talking to the Emiratis. They're talking to the Kuwaitis. They're talking with the Bahrainis. And there is still, as of yet, no. Natural, no natural gas is materialized. I mean, so I, I wouldn't put too much stock into that report because they're frankly talking to everyone, and they're 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 talking to everyone, but um, they haven't been able to, to produce in both the figurative and the literal sense of the word as of yet. Is there a competition among the GCC to try to supply uh, Pakistan and India, or uh, outside of uh, Qatari LNG? Uh, not really, I mean, because the rest of the countries, I mean, the UAE is locked into certain long-term contracts, um, principally with the Japanese, although there are some uh, other buyers. The Omanis as well, they have long-term contracts, uh, but uh, most of the countries outside of Qatar are not really seeking to rapidly expand their LNG uh, capacity to export the gas or to even build pipelines. Um, they are struggling with their natural gas, uh, with their domestic demand. So uh, outside of Qatar, no other country is, is even contemplating uh, that. And Qatar will only sell to the Pakistanis if the Pakistanis are willing to pay. I mean, so that's the primary uh, criteria for the Qataris is that you have to pay for the gas. That's one. And you have to accept that the gas may not be on a long-term contract. So these are two major issues. And you have to accept that. Otherwise, the Qataris will say, we just sell your gas. We we'll just sell the gas to the Japanese. And Japanese are known to pay nearly anything because they don't produce any uh, energy on their own. So they're basically a, a captive market that you can basically dictate the prices to. One other question. Uh, what do you uh, hear about the problem of a joint field that Iran and Qatar have? I mean, this is South Pars. Right, right, the North Dome. Yeah. The North and Dome field is actually the entire complex. And then on the country side of the maritime maritime border is actually uh, called the North Field, and then uh, the Iranian side is called South Pars. Uh, so, so you're you're talking about the joint development plans? For well, that? right now, I mean, the Iranians are not really exploiting that yes. field, so uh, the gas travels, right? Yes, migrants, uh, right. So uh, what the Qataris are getting out, I mean, this competition, I think competition <laughs> for exploitation, and that sort yes. of affects the pricing structure, because there. When you have a joint field, yes. every producer thinks the oil is free. I mean, the, ga the natural gas is free, right? Because if they don't get it, the other guy will get it. Uh, what's that called? The failure of the commons? Right? Yes, so it's the tragedy of commons. Yeah, a tragedy, excuse right. me. Right. Tragedy of the commons. So, right. uh, if if that really kicks into high gear and both countries try to suck that feet dry, yes. you know, it's going to be a pressure, downward pressure on prices, no? Uh, yes, if the Iranians were actually uh, producing from uh, the South Pars, I mean, but they haven't ramped up production, so. Uh, basically, the countries have been the ones who have uh, really focused on uh, production, and they've really gone through with uh, producing quite uh, admirably with uh, the field. Uh, now, if you recall, the run-up to the, uh, the Kuwait or the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, uh, Iraq was actually uh, alleging that Kuwait was overproducing from the joint field, and that was, I guess, one of the, uh, I guess, supposed justifications for uh, invading uh, Kuwait at that time to stop. The oil from migrating over to the Kuwaiti side. Uh, several years ago, uh, Iran uh, made a similar complaint against Qatar uh, that the countries were overproducing uh, from uh, the North Field, and that Iran would take unspecified action against the countries if they continue uh, this blatant disregard for the Iranian uh, patrimony. Uh, and the Iranians and the countries they met and they were able to negotiate. And uh, I think that they came up with some type of quid pro quo whereby uh, the Iranians have accepted, uh, to a certain extent, uh, country plans. And also, the country's institute of moratorium until 2014 has been repeatedly extended. So as of yet, uh, there's not any uh, significant capacity expansion of the North Field. And when this moratorium ends, uh, the countries are not going to, uh, in my view, they aren't going to rapidly uh, increase uh, capacity, uh, simply because the market is, um, is swamped. Uh, with uh, natural gas. It's a buyer's market right now. And uh, as a result, uh, the countries don't want to put on, don't want to have too much overcapacity. Uh, so we're going to see that when the moratorium ends, 2004, 2013, 2014, the countries are going to be focusing much more on domestic uh, supply. So uh, focusing uh, their uh, gas supply on the domestic market for industrialization. And there's not going to be this rapid uh, 
capacity expansion uh, that we have seen uh, in the past years with the North Field. So uh, the Iranians might be a bit more um, uh, relaxed about uh, country plans after moratorium ends. When you're talking to public officials, uh, is there any serious talk about introducing uh, pricing reforms in electricity tariffs? Uh, okay, it depends what you uh, what you term serious. Uh, it's it's okay. All the strategies that I went over uh, before, uh, right here. Okay, all these strategies are basically to mitigate the impact of the of the the, the power the power crisis uh, in the Gulf, and uh, not one of them really deals with uh, reformation of the pricing structure. Okay, so if you look at renewable energy, okay, the must are must our project nuclear energy, if you look at reinjection alternatives, it's not really focused on price. If they focused on price, that would have two uh, significant impacts. One, it would drive down this retail demand that is just sucking uh, the blood out of uh, the, Gulf, uh, the Gulf natural gas sector. Okay, it's, 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 it's focusing it on, uh, on domestic power production for the retail sector, which is not really that productive in my view. It doesn't really contribute to the national economy. Okay, so it would drive down that retail uh, that retail demand, and then what it would do is it would increase the investment in these fields at the same time, so it would increase the natural gas uh, production. Uh, but as of yet, there has been extremely limited talk uh, and, and limited action in terms of um, uh, pricing reformation. There have been uh, tariffs that have uh, been introduced in Dubai, for instance, uh, several years ago uh, to increase the pricing uh, framework for non-nationals, and actually in Sharjah, actually in Sharjah 2009, they increased right after the blackout, it was, it was actually announced two or three days after blackout, they increased the price for non-nationals by about, if my memory serves me correctly, about 30 to 40 percent, they increased the price uh, for uh, the electricity tariff for non-nationals. Uh, nationals still pay the same <coughs> price if, if they pay um, at all. So, so there is talk about that, and there have been fits and Start starts in, in terms of uh, reforming the pricing uh, structure, but as of yet, there, there hasn't been a sustained movement uh, towards doing that. And I, it looks a bit um, discombobulated uh, from where observers stand. Okay, well, thank everyone for coming. Um, if anyone needs to contact me for any information, there's my uh, email address, and I'm always available to talk. Thank you very much for coming. Great. Great.